in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My name is Iris George, and I work with Amigos for Christ. Amigos for Christ is a nonprofit organization. We're based out of Buford, Georgia, and we're also based in Chinandega, Nicaragua. Our mission and the heartbeat of what we do is we serve. We serve to make Christ visible. We are a community development organization. We work in five primary areas. We work in water and sanitation, health, education, economic development, and leadership. And really the start and kind of the foundation is water and sanitation. It's kind of the building blocks for a lot of what comes afterwards. So for example, for a family that does not have clean water, it means that most likely they'll not be sending their kids to school. And the reason why is because they need help to walk to the well every day to gather the water, to bring it home. Economic development as well, the ability for families to go out and earn an income. They need to make sure that their family has their basic necessities. And then you think about health and you think about parasites and different um, diseases that families will get. Um, water is a big fundamental part of how we do community development and our goal really is to have a clean bathroom and clean running water to every home. We commit to a community for seven years, we're on board with them, we're their partners, we walk alongside with them, but then really at the end of the seven years we have kind of a three-year process where we move out and we really want communities to be able to be independent and for their local leadership to really lead the way forward for the communities. So the Amigos Academy is one of our, um, I would say one of our neatest projects. It is a private school in rural Nicaragua and it really is offering students the opportunity for an excellent education and an innovative ed education and just something that is really not seen in the area. So the academy is really where we're wanting Life Point to be involved. The academy has recently started a scholarship program which allows um, anyone that is wanting to help a child walk through their, their years at the primary school, they can get involved with a scholarship program and, um, and really have an ongoing relationship with a child. I know you guys recently had a trip down there and um, I know you guys had people from your church that were able to spend time with the kids down there and do some arts and crafts. Those of you that have been down there um, or that are possibly thinking about going down there in the future, you're going to get the opportunity to meet the child that you have, um, that you're sponsoring. And then the other thing that is really amazing about being involved in the scholarship program is it starts to address this generational need that as parents are making decisions for their kids, they are having the option to be able to choose something that will change their kids' future, that will change their grandkids' future, and that can really um, change the opportunities down the line. So the scholarship program, I think, is one of the neatest things to get to be part of because of the relationship that you get to build with um, a child in Nicaragua, and then also with what can happen down the line and with their future, and, and to be able to walk that through with a child is a really neat opportunity. Amen, amen. Good morning, church. How we doing? Good. It is good to see you this morning. Welcome to Life Point Church. My name is Blake. I am one of the pastors here. And uh, the video you just saw was uh, from a, an organization that we partner with called Amigos for Christ. And we've sent some teams down to Nicaragua to work with them uh, several times. And they're just an incredible, incredible organization. Uh, you heard a lot about uh, their needs and what they're doing. And so uh, it's just a really, really cool place to go if you ever get a chance to go with one of our teams and do that. The reason we show you this and the reason you're going to be seeing several of these videos over the next several weeks is because we have something coming up on September 4th called the Share Campaign. The Share Campaign is a, a annual offering we take every single year that 100% of it goes towards missions, all right, 100% of it. And so we ask you to give over and above your regular tithes and offerings. We ask you to give sacrificially. This is above what, we, what we're called to give as believers, over and above your regular tithes and offerings. And 100% of that goes to organizations like, like Amigos for Christ and several others that we work with. And so you'll be hearing from a lot of those over the next few weeks to talk about how we can partner with people all over the world uh, locally, nationally, internationally to, 
to spread the gospel. So I'm excited about that. But I ask you to go ahead and begin to pray about that. One of the cool things about Amigos for Christ, you heard her talk about the scholarship program. Uh, one of, the, uh, one of our, our people here, Rick Hatch, uh, has been involved with Amigos for Christ for years, has, set, has sponsored several children through the uh, scholarship program. And like she said, you actually get to interact with these kids. This isn't you're just you know, sending your money somewhere. You get to have a relationship with these kids. In fact, one of the kids that, that Rick sponsored moved to America, is now living in Cashers, which is about 45 minutes from here, and he gets to have a relationship with, with him. It's just a really, really cool story and, uh, and a really good thing to do. So uh, go ahead and begin to, to pray about how you can be involved in that. All right, speaking of building things, today we start a brand new series called Be the Church, and we are excited about this series because every single, at least once a year, all right, at least once a year, we try to come together, all of uh, everybody at LifePoint Church, and get together on the mission and the vision and the purpose and the plan of what God has ultimately called us to do, this local church that we call LifePoint Church, right? Because what happens is, over time, you have something we call missional drift, all right? Missional drift that, you know, nine years ago, we'll celebrate our nine-year anniversary next week. So be here at Birthday Bash, right? Nine years! Something to get excited about. Oh. That's good news. Right, nine years, we made it. We're almost double digits. Anyways, so, um, so uh, over time, what begins to happen is if you just get off mission a little bit, and maybe you do something you say you're not going to do, or you don't do something you say you are going to do, and you get off just a little bit, before you know it, over time, you're way far away from where you really want it to be. And so what we like to do at least once a year in a, on Sunday morning is get everybody together and talk about our purpose and our plan and why God has us here and how he wants us to affect our community. And so that's what this series is about. Now, mainly today I want to talk about one word. One word. And it's interesting how people can see a word and think different things. Okay, let me give you a couple of examples. Football. It's almost football season, yeah? Yeah. All right? Go Tigers, right? We're excited. It's almost uh, college football season. Um, but when we say football here in this part of the world, we mean football, right? Pads and helmets and first downs and touchdowns. Like, that's football. All the pagans everywhere else in the world <laughs> think football is what? Soccer. Hey, who likes soccer? Ain't nobody likes soccer, right? It may, sorry, I know I'm offended, but some of you like soccer. But it's the same thing. I mean, it's the same word. It means completely different things. Let me give you, I know we have a lot of transplants here. We have people from you know, Minnesota, New York, New Jersey, and California, and all kinds. So let me, tell, let me give you a little Southern culture here, okay? In the South, when you say you want a Coke, all right, a Coca-Cola, all right, uh, we think, you think, if you're from somewhere else, you think Coca-Cola. But when we say Coke, it's really an umbrella word for all soft drinks, right? So we may say Coke, but we might mean a Mountain Dew or a Sprite or whatever. It's like, you want a Coke? It really means soda. And some of you are from the North, you're going, well, no, that means pop. No, pop here is what we call our grandpa, right? <laughs> that's, that's pop. So it means different things. Here's another, this is a great one. Okay, this would be a good little social experiment, okay? Um, when I say the word dinner, okay, I'm here murmuring, right? When I say the word dinner, who in here thinks lunch? Lunch? Okay, it usually is a smaller crowd. You're wrong. I love you, but you're wrong. <laughs> who thinks supper? Okay. And half of you are like, I don't know, right? Or, you're, or either you're lazy. Like, this isn't that hard. Like, pick one or the other. <laughs> All right. So, same word, different meanings. Now, when I say the word church, the word church, there is probably a reaction inside of each one of us. In fact, other than the name Jesus, the word church is probably the most polarizing word ever uttered. For some of you, there's a very positive reaction, right? Maybe that's why you're here, a very positive reaction, right? It's, where, it's a place where you found salvation, where you found redemption, where you found Jesus. It's a place where you found belonging and community. And so when I say the word church, you have a very good feeling, your spirit kind of lightens up. For some of you, the word church can be wildly negative. Like you've been hurt in church, possibly several times either by pastors or leaders or gossip. Maybe you've been lied to, misled, ignored. Maybe you've been taken advantage of. Or maybe you feel like you're not worthy to be in church. 
Like, I've done too much. You just don't understand who I am. Like, I'm not worthy to be in church. But not only this, do we have a certain feeling when we hear the word church, there's lots of ideas about what church is. Like, is church a building? Is it a people? Is it a hierarchy? Is it a religious organization? Is it a 501c3? Like, what is a church? And there's some of you in here that might think, you know, Blake, I'm not really sure what church, what church is, but what I do know is that they can't agree on anything. And you're probably right. You're, a lot of you are right on that. In fact, churches are segmented by what they disagree on. Do you know this? They're called denominations. And there's hundreds, hundreds of them. And they're formed because a group of people can't agree on a certain thing. So we'll take our ball and we'll play over here. And we'll call it this. We'll call it Baptist. We'll call it Presbyterian. We'll call it Methodist. And they're, we're organized by what we disagree on. And so today what I want to do is I want to define the word in the concept of church because I think, I think it might mean something much different than what some of you might think. You see, the first time we see the word church translated in our English Bibles is in Matthew chapter 16. You can turn there with me. I would ask you to turn there with me. Matthew chapter 16. And in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is in a place with his disciples called Caesarea Philippi, kind of an, easy, kind of a, an evil place. And... They're having a conversation. He looks at his disciples and he says, who do people say I am? And they look back at him and say, well, there's a lot of concepts about who you are. A lot of ideas. Like some people say you're Elijah. Some people say you're a prophet. Some people say you're John the Baptist reincarnate. Like there's a lots of different ideas about who you are. But Peter stands up. And Peter looks at Jesus and he says, I believe that you're the Messiah. The son of the living God. Now, we're 16 chapters into the book of Matthew. This is the first time that his guys have looked at him and confessed, you're the Messiah. You're the son of God. And Jesus turns to Peter, and he says this in verse 18 of Matthew chapter 16. He says, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my what? My church. And the gates of Hades will not be able to overcome it. Now, the Greek word here is the word ecclesia. Ecclesia. What it means is a group of people who have been called out for a specific purpose. That's what it means. So that when Jesus says, on you I will build my church, or what we have translated as church, it means ecclesia. A group of people that I've called out for a specific mission and a specific purpose. In fact, the word ecclesia is not really even a religious word. In fact, it was used most for armies. It was a military term that, that they would call out Young men create an ecclesia in order to go and accomplish a mission, which makes sense because Jesus says that my kingdom will progress. I will advance my kingdom and the gates of hell won't be able to stop it. Simply put, when Jesus says that he will establish his church, what he's talking about is a movement. It's a movement. It's called to advance. It's called to go. It's called to move. And we see the beginning stages of this movement in Acts chapter 2, when Peter and the rest of the disciples, at a, a certain day that the, the Jews called Pentecost, they, they stood up and, in front of all the people filled with the Holy Spirit and began to proclaim the gospel. And it says in Acts chapter 2 that 3,000 men, I don't know how many men, women, and children it was, but we're just told 3,000 men came to know Jesus and got saved. And all of a sudden, this, this church was birthed out of this day. We know it as the birthday of the church, Pentecost. And so from that day on, those people split up into groups, right? And they met from house to house. So they met from house to house. They would have a meal together. They would pray together. They would read scripture together. They would partake in the Lord's Supper together. And it began to explode like wildfire. And because Christianity was so explosive, and because these fringe cult kind of people that the Christians were, that's what people, people thought they were, a Jewish cult. It began to grow. And because it began to grow, they began to be persecuted. In fact, in 64 AD, the emperor Nero, which was a madman, this guy was crazy, he set fire to his own city, to Rome. In fact, scholars say that three-fourths of the city was completely burned to the ground. And Nero, the one who started the fire, Rumors started to go around that he was the one that started it. And so when he heard the rumors, he's, he decided, huh, who can I blame? Who can be my scapegoat? Who can I pin this on? You know who he picked? 
Christians. And so they arrested a few Christians. And then they arrested most of the Christians. They got them all together, began to persecute them in horrible ways. They sent dogs. They fed them to dogs. They burned them alive. They hung them upside down. An intense persecution broke out in Rome. But Jesus said that he was going to establish and build his church and the gates could hell could of hell could not stop it, much less the Roman government. And so it didn't stop there. It kept going, and it kept going, and God continued to progress and grow his kingdom. And then in 313 AD, something very interesting happened. The emperor Constantine, the emperor of Rome, his name was Constantine, he became a Christian. And now something that they had to do in secret a movement that started in secret and grew in secret. Now, the emperor of Rome believed it. So guess what he did? He made it legal. To where there was no, no more persecution of the church. And now, this small little sect of people could now worship in freedom. And, and a lot of us will say, well, that's a great thing, right? Christianity became mainstream. That's debatable. Some people believe the worst thing that ever happened to Christianity is that it became legal. Because you can't be a fringe Christian when you're facing death, can you? And because it became legal, prominent Romans began to bring their ideas into what church should look like. So they brought all their ideas, because they used to be pagan worship, right? They used to worship all these pagans. So they brought those ideas of worship now into the church. And these rich Romans were now worshiping Jesus. And so they brought their former ideas of worship, like ornate clothing and processionals and choirs. Like those things aren't inherently Christian. Those things were cultural in their day. They just brought them into their worship. And they began to build big places for people to come and gather called basilicas. And as the gospel progressed. Guess what they did? They built more basilicas and they built more houses of worship and they became these big architectural spectacles that were just unbelievable. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. These people wanted to build something beautiful out of their love for God. There wasn't necessarily inherently wrong with that. But here's what happened. About 1000 AD, a German word begins to appear in literature describing these buildings. It was the word Kirsch or Kirsha, which should look familiar because it's where we get our English word what? Church. Kirsch actually means house of the Lord. So our word church actually means house of the Lord. But what, so here's what's interesting. When the, when the translators of the English New Testament, when they translated it from Greek to English, when it came to this word that Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16, that on this rock I will build my ecclesia, my group of people who have been called out to, to do a specific purpose and a specific plan, when it came to translate that word, they didn't use any word that kind of gives that connotation. What word did they use? Church. Two completely different ideas. Because a church is a building that has doors and windows and brick and mortar. An ecclesia is a movement with a purpose and an identity. You can lock the doors of a church. You can't lock the doors of an ecclesia. Unfortunately, the term we use to describe a building took place of what Jesus described as a movement. And the ecclesia quickly moved from being a movement to becoming a monument. The ecclesia became a place instead of a face. It became a building instead of a body. It was no longer a group of people with a specific identity and purpose. It was a location. And I would say that every argument that the church has had over the last 30, 50, 100 years about pews and chairs or carpet or contemporary music or traditional music has been born out of the fact that the ecclesia has gone from being a movement to a monument. And if you're in here today and you're turned off by Christianity, or maybe when I say the church or Christian, you get a very negative connotation, you're turned off. The reason you might be turned off is because the church has lost its sense of identity and purpose and traded it in 
for something we could isolate from the rest of our lives. I can now go to church and go home and be whoever I want to be. I can isolate my place from what I, myself from what I call the church because it's easy to isolate myself from a building. I can go to a building and leave. Like, praise God, after I leave Walmart, I can forget about Walmart. <laughs> right? Nobody wants to, I mean, you want to leave Walmart. In fact, praise God for Dollar General, right? They've cut off all roads to Walmart. It's incredible. I don't have to go to Walmart anymore. Because I can isolate myself from a building. I can separate myself from a facility. I can't separate myself from being called out. I can't separate myself from mission and purpose. I can't, com- I can't compartmentalize being a part of a body. Jesus taught that true believers should affect their community. Look at how many t- times Jesus said, give to the poor. Take care of orphans. Take care of widows. Jesus was passionate about people. He was not passionate about building or programs or procedures or bylaws. In fact, you know what Jesus said? The the modern day house of the Lord, or not the modern day, the Jesus time house of the Lord was called a what? It's called a temple. And you know what Jesus said? Jesus said you could tear the temple down. I'll build it up in three days. What was he talking about? He wasn't talking about a building. He was talking about his body. He said, you can tear the temple down. In fact, one day, spirit-filled believers all over the world, they will be my spiritual house. That's what Paul says, that we will become a spiritual house that God will dwell in, that we don't need brick and mortar anymore. Believe it or not, the spread of the gospel to the ends of the earth will have very little to do with buildings and programs and pastors. But churches have fallen into this mindset that if we're going to change the community, it's going to happen here. we got to get people here. And if it's going to happen here, then we need to have the best programs, the best music, the best facilities, the best pastors, the best speakers. But when you look at the early church and you look at where gospel, the gospel spreading all over the world, they don't have any of these bells and whistles. It's the people of God and the word of God. And that is all we need. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't mind facilities. Facilities are not inherently bad. Programs are not inherently bad. Good music is not bad. Praise the Lord, right? Like Those things are good. We should do them excellently because we do them to the glory of God. But if we work to maintain those things all the while ignoring the true need outside the walls of the church, then we have failed as the church. So what does it mean to be the ecclesia? Three aspects of the ecclesia, all right? The first one is that there is this overall concept in Matthew chapter 16 of Jesus' ecclesia, all right? Jesus is a group of people who have been called out. This is what we call the church invisible. Not that you can't see us, but that it's more of a concept that, that we are, as God's people, the umbrella of the church is God's people who have been called out. This is Jesus' church. Okay? The next aspect of the ecclesia is what we call local ex- ecclesias. All right? We see this in God's word as Paul writes his letters. If you go and you read Paul's letters like Ephesus and Colossians and Philippians, when you read those, at the beginning of those letters, what does Paul say? He, he writes them specifically to a group of people. He says, to the ecclesia at Colossae, to the ecclesia at Ephesus, to the ecclesia at Philippi. Like These letters were written to specific groups of people who have been called out to affect their communities. So we have Jesus' ecclesia, we have the local ecclesia, and then what makes up the local ecclesia are these things called disciples. And Jesus' command was for us to make disciples. Now, a disciple is simply a follower. A disciple is simply somebody who has a, who has a model that they want to be like. So if, if the disciples were model their life after Jesus, he's saying, listen, I want you to go and, and have, teach people to model their life after me. That's all a disciple is. We make it too complicated. And so the purpose, and that, the, this disciple part, this is our job. 
all right? It's all Jesus' job, but it's our responsibility, right? That we are ultimately he called to, commanded to make disciples. That's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are called to make disciples who make disciples. We are called to be disciple makers. So the purpose of LifePoint Church is to multiply disciples and multiply churches. And we believe that we can be a part of building God's kingdom, his, his kingdom building plan, that we can be a part of that. We can be a part of building his ecclesia. And the way we do that is we make disciples who ultimately become part of a local ecclesia, which ultimately become part of Jesus' ecclesia. And that's how this works. And so here's the deal. Can we all agree that in order to fulfill Jesus' words, his command of building local churches everywhere. In order to do that, then it is our job to make disciples. Can we agree on this? We can agree on this. That's, that's, that's what we're called to do. We're called to make disciples. So the question becomes how? How do we do that? <laughs> there is a whole Christian industry that was created to figure out how we, how we make disciples. Right? You know how many books are written on discipleship training? Or making disciples? How many, how many um, Bible studies are written? How many professionals are hired in order to make disciples? And here's the funny thing. Jesus tells us. Like, and as long as we follow what he tells us, then, then we can make disciples just like Jesus did, right? I mean, am I crazy? It's pretty simple. So how did Jesus tell us to do it? One of my favorite books in the, in, uh, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible is John chapter 13. Colossians 1, John chapter 13, probably my two favorite chapters in the Bible. But in John chapter 13, if you want to turn there with me, you can. In John chapter 13, um, Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples, and chapter 13 is filled with all kinds of I'm going away language, all right? I'm going away. I'm about to go be crucified. I'm about to go away. You're not going to be with me anymore. Some of the last things he's going to tell them, last instruction he's going to tell them. It's kind of like parents when you're going to leave the house and your kids are old enough to stay at home. It's the last thing you tell them right before you leave. If you forget everything else, remember this. And here's what Jesus tells his disciples in verse 33. He says, my children, I will be with you only a little longer you will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I'm going, you cannot come. Verse 34. A new command I give you. All right. A new command. Right, this is going to be something new. Like Jesus is about to give them the keys to unlock the kingdom of God. Like This is going to be good. If the last three years of Jesus is teaching his disciple was the bachelor level courses, like he was about to start master's level courses right here. Right? A new command I give you. And then he drops this bomb on them. You ready? Love one another. <laughs> I'm sure the disciples went. That's not new. Like, come on, Jesus. Like, pagans love each other. You have to be a Christian to love each other. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? And then he said this. He qualifies the type of love he's talking about. He says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Now, that's different. Because ain't nobody love people like Jesus loved people. As I have loved you, so love one another. By this, by this, by this one reason, by this one reason, the way that you love each other like Jesus has loved you, that by this, everyone will know that you are my what? That everyone will know by the way you love each other, that it is the distinguishing factor between you and the rest of the world, how you love each other. Everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Now, Peter, I love, I love Peter. Peter completely misses the point, like completely, right? In fact, Peter heard nothing that Jesus said about the whole love thing, and all he heard was, I'm going away. That's all he heard. And we know that because Peter says this, the very next verse, Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? He didn't say anything about the love part. Where are you going? Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. And Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Right? Peter's declaring his love. And Jesus looks at Peter and goes, Peter, in a few hours, a six-year-old girl will, will intimidate you into denying me. 
Like, don't tell me how much you love me. I don't need that right now. What I need is this. I need you to go and create communities where the distinguishing factor between you and all the communities around you is the way you love each other. That's your job. Peter, on you, I will build my ecclesia. I will build my church. That's, my, that's your job, Peter. And so I wonder if Peter's thinking, what does that look like? What does it look like to do that? Well, Jesus had just shown them. Earlier in chapter 13, verse 14 says this. Jesus says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Why? Because I have set an example for you that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you that no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, they're not ignorant anymore, like they know them. Now that you know them, you will be blessed if you what? Do them. It's one thing to know how to love each other. It's another thing to actually carry it out and do it. That's the hard part. And how do we do that? We do that by serving each other. Jesus is saying, as our Lord and teacher, that he was serving us, and as messengers of his ecclesia, then we should do as his, he has done, that we serve. That if this ecclesia is a movement, not a monument, and we are heralds of this movement, then we should be serving and not just sitting. The church isn't a place for you just to sit. A church is a place where we are called into action. And now I get it, okay, I get it. Some of you, you're here, you're a college student, maybe you just walked, we got a lot of college students here this morning. You're a freshman, or you're a sophomore, and you're, you're thinking, man, I've only got three or four, I got four years at Clemson. It doesn't really make sense to get involved in a local church, right? I mean, I'm only gonna be here for four years, I'm gonna move somewhere. I'm only here for four years, I hope, hopefully. <laughs> right, maybe five. If you're me, five and a half. You say, why, why would I do that? Well, here's why. It's because as a disciple, you're called to be a part of a local what? Local ecclesia. Because when you move one day, guess what you're going to become a part of? You're going to need to be a part of a local church there, which is ultimately a part of Jesus' church. We're always ultimately making our way to being part of Jesus' ecclesia. So maybe that's you, or, or maybe, if, maybe for everybody, not just college students, maybe you've never been involved in any type of church, and you don't even know where to start, like the barrier of entry, you just don't know how to get around it. Like you haven't asked the right, taught the right person, you're like, I just don't know, I don't know, I don't know, right? I don't know how to get, I don't know how to serve, I don't know how to, how to, how to get a mission, I don't know how to be a part, I don't know what to do, all right? Well, over the next few weeks, we're going to try to make that very, very clear, very clear. Maybe you don't even have the desire to be a part of the church. Maybe coming to church on Sunday morning, maybe that's good enough for you. And I understand, we're not gonna point a gun at you, we're not gonna point and laugh if you don't get involved, like we're not gonna do that, all right? But my prayer, and I'm praying for you, each one of you, over the course of this week that you would become increasingly uncomfortable simply sitting and not serving. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to tell you what it looks like to be a part of the church, to be the church, to be God's ecclesia at LifePoint Church. And we're not going to force you to do anything. We're going to be very clear about how you can get active. Because the fact is, listen, one day, this building is going to crumble. Could be in 50 years, could be in 100 years, could be 1,000 years, I don't know. This building is going to go away. And the place you know as LifePoint Church won't exist anymore. But that's fine. Because Jesus isn't interested in preserving monuments. That's why he has established and is preserving still and advancing this movement. So if you want to be a part of the kingdom of God, a kingdom legacy in this community that will far outlast this building or this season in your life or even your life itself that hell cannot stop, then we won't have to force you to be a part of anything. It should come out of just an overflow of who we are. Because ultimately, if we just do this, then we have failed. 
If we just fill up two buildings, we failed. If this is as far as it goes. And so if we're gonna be this movement, this takes every single one of us. Love, share, living like Jesus. And we'll talk about how that plays out over the next few weeks. Let's pray. God, we... God, we thank you that we have a story worth telling. We have a model worth modeling. That you have given us the opportunity to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. What an honor it is to be a part of your kingdom be a child of God. God, let us not settle for crumbs that fall from your table, but allow us, God, to understand that you have called us to feast at it. And if we come in here and just sit, Lord, if we come in here and just sit, then we're settling for crumbs. But allow us to to, to, to be shown the goodness of God and then in turn show it to other people to love as you have loved us. Allow us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, one of the things that we are called to do as a church together is take what's called the Lord's Supper or communion. And so there's a couple of things about communion. Communion, uh, there's two aspects of it. There's the bread, which represents the body of Christ. In fact, in John chapter 13, the same chapter we were reading from a while ago, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he says, this is my body that's been broken for you. And then he took the wine or the, we have juice, you know, because I just don't do wine anymore for some reason. <laughs> Anyways. And it, <laughs> it represents the blood of Jesus. And it's like what what Paul told us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, where he says that, that, that God has, that, that Jesus has been made a sin offering for us, and so he has gotten our sin, and we have received his righteousness. That when we trust in his broken body and his blood that was shed, that it covers our sin, so that when God sees us, what he sees is perfection, he sees righteousness. And that sin comes with punishment. And when Jesus was crucified on the cross, that he took the punishment for my sin. So I become a child of God and my sin was punished on Jesus. And so when I take communion, I am bringing that into my body. It is becoming part of me. His body, his blood is is applied to me. And so there's a couple of things I'd ask you to do. If you're in here this morning and you're not a believer, not a Christian, We're not going to point at you. We're not going to laugh. Here's what I'd ask you to do. Simply don't partake. Because if if we take this in, this is a very symbolic thing for us, very sacred thing for us, that we we don't commune with the body and the blood of Christ unless we believe in the body and the blood of Christ. And we don't mean to leave you out. We don't mean for it to be exclusive. It just kind of is. And so if, if we don't ask you to do anything else, then just kind of sit still when we do this. Another thing I'd ask you to do is we want to repent. One of the things we're called to do is repent. To try to purify, to, 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 to confess sins that have not been confessed to the Lord. And that's more for us than for God. Because <laughs> God knows. It's more for us to identify those things. That if I'm going to come into communion with God, I don't want to have these sins in my life. And so I'm going to give you space to do that. In a minute, I'm going to get off the stage. And I'm going to give you a few minutes just to sit in silence. Just to reflect and to pray. And maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. Maybe you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus. And maybe during that time you want to do that. And maybe this is a birthday for you. This is a spiritual birthday for you. You take communion for the first time with the body, with your brothers and sisters in Christ. But maybe it's time for you, if you're already a believer, to just repent of sins in your life. Confess those. Get those out in the open before God and then come and partake in his body and in his blood. But let's be faithful to do it. I'm going I'm to ask God to bless it.
and then I'm going to get off the stage. There are five, listen, there are five different places. There are three up here, and there is uh, uh, one on the, the wall over here and one on the wall over here. So I'm going to ask you just to spend a few minutes in prayer. Then you're going to get up. You're going to come to one of the stations, grab the, the bread, grab the juice, go back to your seat, and you can partake of it yourself there. It's a personal thing you do between you and God. All right? All right, let's pray. God, we love you. And we thank you for this time together. God, I pray that you will bless this time. If there's somebody in here that needs to confess, unconfess sin to you, like get, get rid of something, God, I pray that we use this time to do it. God, I pray if there's anybody in here who have never given their life to Jesus, God, show them your grace and your goodness. Holy Spirit, open their eyes to the goodness of God in Jesus Christ. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for sacrificing yourself for us. I pray that you'll bless this food as we take it and as we remember you. In Jesus' name, amen.